Hello, hello, and welcome to the Empire's Guide to Domination. So, first up, we're going to be taking a look at a couple of replays, showcasing the general playstyles that the Empire can fall into in Domination. Then we're going to do a breakdown of the roster, talk about each individual unit, and what I use it for in my armies. And then we're going to look at a couple of sample compositions, kind of army comps that I would generally take into a lot of things. Uh, as you may have guessed, this is mostly geared to Domination, but this information could help you in land battles or campaign as well. Well, let's get started. First up, we have a proper full kite build. So we've got some heavy cavalry, we've got some war wagons, and we've got some grenade launchers. And that's our really heavy kiting skirmishing core. We've got the grenade launchers to kill the infantry, we've got war wagons to kill large things, we've got the uh, knights of the blazing sun to keep all those things safe from anything that might try to attack me. It gets warriors of chaos, which means they do have large amounts of infantry for us to shoot in, and not a whole lot that can actually threaten our knights of the blazing sun, which means we can push up really, really aggressively and just start trying to get some shots off. They summon Hellstriders to try and contest us, our next to Blazing Sun, chase them off, and we can shoot them on their way out. And this means we can get some really, really greedy shots and really pump out that value before giving up any real ground or letting them get much trade back onto us in return. All the while we're up here skirmishing, we are summoning an infantry to try and secure the objectives for us, as well as our Deathcaster to try and just buna any of the cavalry that does try to contest us, which means we will have a very secure... Uh, mobility dominance, which will allow our grenade launchers and our war wagons to just keep skirmishing and keep on shooting them to pieces. All the while, they're just trying to advance on our gunfire. We are managing to cap all three objectives, which is good for us. That buys us a lot of time to let us just keep shooting. And then we just have our knights stay nice and close to our grenade launchers to prevent any hell striders from getting on top of them. And this is really a key. Just keep your knights blazing sun near your grenade launchers so that they can keep pushing aggressively. Also, if there's any armored cav pushing up on us, we have our war wagons start shooting into them. And we really just want to keep shooting and giving ground, shooting and giving ground. As the infantry pushes up, we just keep backing off shooting. If our knights of blazing sun are idle, we can't have them just start charging into infantry and try to break them off, especially if they're low health. Try to route them, Buna you know, going down the hell striders, keep them off of our cav and our grenade launchers. The cav just keeps on, you know, charging whenever infantry is low, break them off, grenade launchers keep shooting, war wagons are shooting anything that's threatening us. All the while our infantry is pushing up to help us clean up once we are ready. And we just kind of rinse and repeat. Just keep shooting, keep backing off, keep shooting and backing off. This is the essence of the kite style. Just keep shooting, keep focus firing anything that is a threat to our mobility. And then once that threat is eliminated, our grenade can just keep shooting the infantry. And we are accruing a pretty hefty value lead just off of this. We are losing this far side objective, which is fine. All of our force is concentrated on the center. And that's the real power of this kite style is that all of our funds are dedicated to three war wagons, some cav, and some grenade launchers, which can rotate around the map at a moment's notice. We can come over here if we want and try to win this fight, but at the moment we're just over here and we can kind of sack this side, let them have it, and they have all these units over here that aren't really doing anything. They have what, Chaos Warrior, Marauder, Marauder Grey Open, Marauder, that aren't really accomplishing anything, and we're just going to walk away and go win the fight elsewhere. And this kind of full kite style, full mobility, really allows us to take those disadvantaged fights because our opponents are so much slower, they can't rotate the fight as fast as we can. So we can really catch this other force over here, where they're down about 2,000 funds of units that are just sitting off to the side, not doing anything. We also have our war wagons charge in. They do all right in melee, so if you have a low leadership unit like this, you can just charge in and try to break them off and get them to route. This is the kind of scenario where Boris, uh, yeah, Boris, uh, Toddbringer, Boris Toddbringer, not Boris versus, Boris Toddbringer would be very useful to actually come and just tear out all these guys. But we'll do just fine as they are weak on low health and our infantry are able to just come in and clean up. And now I've decided that my infantry are going to win this fight. So I'm going to move my grenade launchers and my skirmish core over to this side, like I mentioned. And now you can come take this fight where they only have a few thousand funds fighting while we have this big, hefty skirmish core coming in to clean them up. And we just mop up nice and clean. And at this point, I'm summoning some great swords as well to just come in and try to mop up all the infantry. But at this point, we're up so much value. We've got a pretty hefty points lead and we can just clean up from here. Yeah, just keep bringing out infantry, keep cleaning them up. And our grenade launchers, if they get out of ammo, if they get low health, we can resummon them, and they can just keep up the reign of terror. And that's the essence of the kite style. For the second style, this time we've got a more infantry-heavy build. We're up against lizardmen this time, who have a lot of shooting of their own and can actually shoot back at their kite very effectively. This time we're going to use an infantry line with huntsmen to really clear the way for our grenade launchers to come clean up. This time we've got Volkmar, we've got a Life Wizard, we've got the Hammer of the Witches, and we've got a bunch of infantry and some Huntsmen, and we'll be summoning in some more of those as well as some cavalry. So, right away we see our opponent has artillery of their own to try and shoot ours, so very quickly what we're going to do is we're going to push up their infantry line to try and screen out their artillery. 
And then we're going to decrew our cannon so that it doesn't get sniped out. It can just sit in the back. The crew can sit over here and just wait until the way is clear. We can push up with our huntsmen and our infantry and try to just make those stegodons go away. Volkmar pushing up is just fine. He's actually extremely tanky, so having him take this kind of fire and really just eat skirmish fire is pretty valuable for us. It means our light infantry, which our infantry is very tanky, so having him absorb that means our front line stays alive a lot longer. And as you can see, he's already healed up quite nicely. So he doesn't take much long-term damage. And then now, once we start getting our huntsmen in range, we can actually push back the enemy artillery, and our cannon can come remount and start firing. Although I would just summon in more infantry and halberds, huntsmen with pushing up starting to shoot, get some shots off to string out any of the large targets. And now we've bought a very healthy amount of space for our cannon to be remounted. That's when we raid launchers come in to start cleaning up the infantry once the fight starts. Our, we have plentiful infantry, but it's not that strong, so it's not really going to be what's winning us the fight. It's just holding space. You see we have this line straight across the center where our opponent can't really get past it very easily, which means, we can, which means we can post up huntsmen or grenade launchers behind it and just kind of free fire as long as our infantry line is alive, and we have a life caster to help keep that infantry live, line along, alive as long as possible. We have some pterodons coming in, and we just focus fire them with the cannons and the huntsmen and really deal with that threat. We will be summoning some cavalry as well to try and deal with any of those backline threats. And all the while, Volkmar is just kind of running through their lines, causing havoc, killing off infantry, doing what he does best. They don't charge into our lines. We just focus fire with the huntsmen. Well, and it's just about kind of keeping that uh, cohesion and keeping our line intact. And uh, yeah. Empire is not the greatest at this whole kind of infantry line style. They are very flimsy. Their infantry is much weaker than, say, dwarves or Cathay, who are also known for this style. Um, but we do what we do have is much higher damage potential on our missiles. So we need to be very proactive and trying to just push up and get shots off with our very high damage huntsmen or grenade launchers to actually ensure that our infantry stays alive long enough to actually protect them because they are just much more flimsy than, again, those dwarven or Cathay infantry that kind of try to do the same thing. And we also have some demigriffs coming in to start peeling off our backline. Anti-large demigriffs are actually very, very good at dealing with a lot of these big backline threats to the pterodons, the stegodons, that kind of thing, even enemy cavalry. They do a very good job as that backline sweeper because they can deal with most large armored targets. You see, as they are pushing into our center, we still have our spears off to the flanks to make sure any cab that gets summoned can't really have an avenue in. And on the far side, we have the same thing, although there is more infantry on the far side, and we're just trying to threaten those salamanders, they can't get any shots off. And we're really just trying to keep our huntsmen and grenade launchers alive and let them keep shooting, as those are our big money makers. Hammer the witches as well, just firing in, trying to shoot the slot, get some value. Meanwhile, our Earthblood caster is just really just spamming Earthblood, giving it a little bit of passive healing to all of our front line, keeping them alive a little, just that little bit longer. And we have to clear out the back line. And that's the essence of it. It's really just a slow push forward, keep your huntsmen and your grenade launchers alive, keep them firing. Be very careful. You don't want to be over eager getting into melee, as you don't win in melee against most things. You're really, really relying on that shooting to do most of your work. So you just want to make sure you're keeping them safe. Don't blow up your infantry here like I'm doing. <laughs> Keep them spread out a little bit more to protect your back line. And have those cavalry in the backfield to come and countercharge anything that gets in your back line. And that is the essence of a slower infantry, Empire infantry build. So, now that we've got an idea of the style we want to go for, or the styles, depending on your preference, let's talk about the units that we're actually going to use to accomplish that. Starting off, we have lords. So there's not a whole lot of competitive lords. The most, the generic lords aren't particularly useful, the Arch Lector, the General of the Empire, the Huntsman, but the unit characters can actually be pretty good for all their own reasons. Marcus Wolfhart is a decent shooter on his own. He has pretty hefty missile strength, or not a whole lot of price. If you take his net, nets are incredibly useful as well as the Amber Bow does pretty good damage. He's not one I take a whole lot, but if there is some kind of large target, like large elite target, like a big monster or an elite cab unit you need, you're really concerned about, having the net, having that anti-large shooting can be very, very useful, though he is a bit pricey for that job. Uh, Balthazar Gelt. So the most common kit I see for him is just Searing Doom and Plague of Rust, usually on a horse, usually without any of this. Um, and to be honest, I'm not a huge fan of Lore of Metal myself. I find Searing Doom and Plague of Rust be somewhat underwhelming spells, personally. But I know other people are very fond of them and have had good success with them. So he is a popular choice. If you're into that, if you're interested, please try it out, decide for yourself. I personally don't really favor him, but he is quite popular. Um, another thing you can do is just take him completely stripped down, as he is your cheapest lord, and just desummon him. If you don't want any of the other lord options, you want a different lord of magic, just desummon him, and you take a wizard of your choice, and then use that as your, you know, Caster. Volkmar, 
as we saw in the lizard game he i use him to mostly bolster my front line and help clear out enemy infantry units in matchups where there's gonna be a lot of enemy infantry that really handily de defeats ours like we saw in the lizard game with saurus uh, just taking him on his war altar usually without divine power or benediction benediction go either way but grand hammer sigmar shield of faith soul fire are all really nice buffs and bombardments to help your front line fight better Jade Griffin keeps him alive and really helps him absorb that skirmish fire, kind of like I was talking about in the replay. Overall, he does help your front line do quite well. He also also a terror source, which means you can help, again, just keep bolstering that front line. And he can grind on points very, very long, but he doesn't want to sit in melee. He wants to be charging between fights, which is a little bit micro-taxing. All right, Boris Toddbringer is another exceptionally popular lord that I am not crazy about. He has a lot of very nice auras. Hold the line for melee defense and leadership. Crush the weak for minus melee, both melee stats and leadership. Stack the white cloak of Ulrich gives him a massive amount of melee attack debuffs. And he has blood roar from his griffin, so he nukes leadership by 12, as well as having fear and terror. He, he self heals, he flies around. He could be a really nice mobile terror piece, lowering those stats, lowering those leadership, and terror bombing very, very effective, effectively. Again, I'm not a huge fan of him because I tend to play the Kiteir style, where that kind of terror can't really be capitalized on as easily. When you're terror routing things, you really want to keep them in melee so that you turn that terror out into a proper route. If they're terror routing and the only thing in melee is Boris, well, a lot of times they're just going to get away and rally. And you buy yourself a few seconds, but not that much. And the melee stats aren't as useful when you're not really in a huge melee grind. So I personally don't like him for the price. He's a little expensive for me, but he can be very, very useful if you are going for a more infantry-heavy build or more melee-heavy build where you have a desire for those frontline buffs. You can also help swing Cav fights pretty heavily. You know, dropping all those debuffs on Cav can be very, very effective, as Cav don't tend to have the highest melee stats. Um, so again, try him out. He's very solid, like I said, very popular. I just don't tend to favor him, as he is quite expensive. Franz, I don't really think Franz has much purpose in Domination. Really what he's good at is a kit like this, and he just goes, and he's a single entity duelist. Single entity dueling isn't a super necessary role in domination. Killing single entities isn't as valuable as you don't need to kill them to cap points, obviously. You just need to really get them out of your backline. And I feel like the Empire just has better tools to do it with. Franz is kind of squishy, and he's melee. You have so many options to just shoot single entities that why would you spend a lot of money on a fairly fragile melee combatant when you could just, you know, shoot them? You also have Demigur Halberds, which also do the job quite well if they, you do need to get in melee, so... I don't often find myself bringing Franz. On to heroes. So the best hero by far is the wizard, just because it gives you more magic options. Um, what I most often find myself bring is that Lore of Life caster. Uh, Earthblood spam with just Life Bloom gives you a lot of map-wide healing on you know, your cavalry, your infantry, and can do quite well. Earthblood is very nice cast on your heavy cav or your skirmishing units. You can get a lot of value there. Um, you can also take, sometimes I take regrowth. I don't really take regrowth unless I have demis. Um, and I'll just, you know, pop that on a Demi that's fighting an enemy cav unit or an enemy elite or something like that. But more often what I do is I actually bring flesh to stone, and I find it does a better job of helping those cav units in those fights. Because, you know, 6% fizz resist is going to do a lot of damage reduction compared to, you know, Vigor is like a, what is it, a 24% max, max HP heal and Vigor Refresh. Vigor Refresh is nice, but I find flesh to stone at the right time for a lot less WOM is just so, so valuable. And because it's so much cheaper, you can spam it a lot more, triggering your life bloom even more, getting more of that map-wide healing, and keeping your infantry alive, alive a lot longer. Um, you can also do Awakening of the Wood, and then just, because it is the cheapest, you just spam it as much as you can, trigger the life bloom, get more map-wide healing. I don't do this a ton, because as I said, I'm not really relying on my infantry or my front line to do much of the fighting, so I don't really want to invest in them a ton. I really want to invest in my elites and my shooters. So I don't typically do that, but it's something you could do. Another solid option is, of course, Burning Head. Just take a Burning Head caster with nothing but Kindle Flame, 500 gold, it'll clear a lot of light infantry for you very, very quickly. Does that job very well. I don't find I need that job a ton because I have grenade launchers, but grenade launchers aren't, aren't viable for whatever reason if I can't bring in a matchup. This guy does very, very well clearing large amounts of, of lightly armed infantry. Um, death I take on occasion. Buna, if there is some kind of cav threat that I can't really deal with in melee. This can do quite well against them, although it doesn't do too well against things like Bretonian Cavs, you have too much HP. They do better against lighter stuff with fewer HP. So I don't bring it a ton, but it is an option. 
Uh, and then you can Kevin's if you need snipe some artillery. Then Urn on Thunderbolt does quite well, does also well into Armored Infantry. But I don't find myself bringing this a ton. Typically I do just stick to Lore of Life as it is, you know, all reliable. There's no, you can't really go wrong with it. As for the other heroes, Empire Captain, again, single entity fighter, kind of like Franz, doesn't really serve a purpose. A lot cheaper, much worse stats. Again, it's not really a role I find myself needing that much. Witch Hunter Captain, he's kind of a hybrid missile and melee, and with so much ammunition, you're never going to spend it all. His abilities are kind of underwhelming. Acquisition is a nice debuff, but has a very short range, and on a foot character, it's pretty hard to utilize, so I don't bring him that much. Warrior Priest is okay. Um, he has similar buffs to Volkmar, um, so they are a little bit weaker, I believe. But I don't bring him a whole lot, because, again, I'm not really relying on my front line. He doesn't have as much killing power on his own like Volkmar does, so the buffs on my infantry units... I mean, their infantry units, the, the Empire infantry units aren't that good, as we'll talk about, so I'm not really relying on them. You could put, put them on a horse and have them ride with your cavalry if you need to, but I find I don't need that very often. My cav usually just does fine on its own, but it's an option if that interests you. Those are good. Gotrek and Felix. Gotrek is kind of the same boat as Franz, where he wants to go fight big armored things, and he does that job just fine, but why would you take him when you could just shoot it? I find shooting it to use would be a much more appealing option. And he can only kill things like one at a time and kind of slowly and he's on foot so he can be avoided. Felix has been seeing a lot of use in Domination lately. Um, but what he really wants to do is buddy up with another foot character and just go grind in your front line. And he doesn't really have a good buddy with the Empire. None of our characters really want to be sat on foot in the front line grinding. Franz and Boris are flying. Volkmar's on his war shrine just charging about. Gilt's a caster, Marx is, is shooting. Like, he doesn't really have a good pairing, so he doesn't really have that much of a spot in the Empire roster, in my opinion. Ulrika is actually an interesting one. Uh, Lore of Shadows isn't that relevant these days. It's Pit of Shades under pretty heavily. Melkos is still okay, so is Enfeebling Foe. But her debuffs are really good. Um, namely, Dancing Blade for a small aura of minus melee attack, and then... I'm not going to try to pronounce this. The blinded effect is very, very nice on her missile shots. You can What you can do is you can pop this, fire one shot at one fight, fire a second shot at another fight, and really influence several different fights that way, and apply this blinded effect that is a pretty hefty debuff for a long time. But that's very micro-intensive to actually pay attention to when she's shooting and get the shots in different spots, as well as she's pretty expensive. So I find I'm usually not willing to sacrifice that much micro to go and do this kind of stuff. When I have lots of cav and missiles to be microing anyway. So I find I'd usually just rather take more cavalry than Ulrika. So it's an option. You could try it. I have not found much success with it. On to infantry. So as I've been saying, infantry, your basic infantry is, it's solid for the price. It's decent light infantry, just low tier infantry. Um, but it's not going to win the game for you. It holds okay, but it is light infantry. It's pretty squishy, vulnerable to a lot of crowd clearing effects. So, it's alright holding the line, it's not going to win the game for you. I find I bring them quite often, they're good for controlling space, keeping your stuff alive, supporting your cavalry with your spears or your halberds. They're not going to win the game for you, they are just a role player of controlling space, protecting your stuff. Flagellants. So, Flagellants are a good unit. They are very good against lightly armed infantry, they clear them very very quickly, they have exceptional offensive stats with their frenzy, strength of the penitent as well, if they start losing the tougher. They're also pretty quick, which does synergize with that kite style you saw before, which means that they can deny enemy infantry engagements if they want, they can just run away, which is very, very valuable. The big problem they have is that they are bugged. There's a bug that's been in the game since Immortal Empires launched almost a year ago, where if these guys are in your reserve, they will not get their frenzy, which lowers their damage output considerably, so you have to start them. And if I am going for that kiteier style, well, then I have other things I want to be starting. I want to start my cab, my grenade launchers, my war wagons. I really don't want to be spending my starting funds on these guys. So I find it really hard to fit them into builds a lot of the time. They're really great when I can, but they're just in a really awkward spot because you can't reinforce them. Sigmar's Sons. Uh, I don't like this unit that much. Um, I'm not really relying on my front line to win fights usually. If I am, I'm bringing Flagellants or Greatswords. Um, these guys are just kind of in an odd spot where Unbreakable isn't that valuable in Dom. Like, sure they stay on the front line a little bit longer, but 
once they lose so many models, they're not going to hold the enemy back anyway. They can just walk past, so Unbreakable isn't that valuable. It means you can't resummon them ever. Their melee stats are fine, but their weapon strength is still quite low, so they're not killing anything but light armor that fast. And we have better things to kill light armor and flagellants, so I just... I'd rather have a flagellant, really, almost every time. I mean, if I have the money, I'll bring these guys, but I really don't like them. Great swords. Great swords have been surprising me quite, quite a bit lately. They will dominate a lot of mid and even high tier armored infantry. Um, they're pretty vulnerable to being shot, they're vulnerable to cav, but if you can control those things, which you often can as the Empire, these guys are really nice to bring in late game and just mop up the remnants of infantry that are left on the field from your grenade launchers, just tearing them apart. Like I said, they do very, very well into armored infantry. You don't really want them fighting cav, you don't want them fighting, getting shot. Get them into infantry, they'll do very, very well for you, though. The Tatter Souls. Obviously, same problem as Flagellants. Um, all they really get... For being an ROR is extra models, about 40 extra models. If we compare them here, they actually have slightly worse stats than the, the seven, six Chevron Flagellants. They're really just paying for those models. And I don't like the extra models. Usually that's too many models. They can't all get in melee at the same time, so you're not really benefiting from them that much, and it just makes them more vulnerable to spells and explosive damage. So I don't ever bring these guys. On to missiles. Base archers. Don't see them a whole lot. Um, because your front line is so flimsy, if you're protecting a missile unit, you want it to be really getting you a lot of bang for your buck. Just going for a lot of cheap archers doesn't do that for you, especially since they're short range. So don't bring these guys that much. Break up militia are kind of nice as a reinforcement summon because they are a little more self sufficient. You don't have to protect them. They can put some good damage downrange. Um, I don't love them, but they're a decent missile unit to come in if you need to poke away at like flyers. Or poke at light cav in the mid game where you can't really summon a proper missile unit to protect it. They're a solid vanguard summon in your reinforcements, but I don't love them. I don't hate them. But they're okay. You never really build around free company militia just because they're they're an okay missile unit, an okay melee unit. They don't do it spectacularly, but they are safe. Crossmen, kind of like archers. Um, if I'm going to be protecting a missile unit, I really want to, it to be doing a lot of damage, and we have if you're hitters than these guys, and safer ones in Huntsman, which we'll get to in a moment. So these guys just kind of overshadowed. Deathjax, Stalked Archer. Yeah, there's not a lot of point to these guys. Stalk and Snipe, when you're short, so short range, isn't that valuable. Um, and again, you have a better unit in Huntsman. These guys are the best archer maybe in the game. They're Really, really solid. Stock and firewall moving means they're actually pretty hard to outshoot, even by longer range archers. Anti large on missiles is so, so strong. They'll destroy. As you saw in the, in the replay, they were destroying a lot of dinosaurs who have over 100 armor. Like, they don't care if you have armor. They hit so incredibly hard. Again, they do fine against infantry as well. Stock and firewall moving means they're very, very good at just walking up and get, not getting shot on the approach. They're pretty squishy, but I mean, they're missile units. So they don't want fighting melee anyway. Uh, yeah. Vanguard deploy means they're nice to come in and kind of clean up after your initial skirmishing phase. Handgunners. <sighs> handgunners. I want to like handgunners. They hit very, very hard. Um, but again, they're very fragile. And they can't shoot infantry very effectively. Which means they're only really good against large armored targets. And uh, like I said, these guys do that job just fine. So again, they're kind of overshadowed. They're outranged by Huntsman. They do probably a little bit better against large single entities, but they're not as versatile as Huntsmen. They cost only a little bit less than Huntsmen, so usually Huntsmen are just the superior option. Um, which is a shame, because I really like Huntsmen. Handguns are cool. Sterling's Revenge is a really solid ROR. Um, they're really expensive compared to the base, but they have armor piercing and a lot more missile strength. So they are almost a pseudo handgun unit that can kind of fend for itself, because they have really exceptional melee stats for missile unit. So this unit, if you need some mid-game, like, heavy-hitting missile strength, and you can't defend a backline, then these guys are a solid choice. Silver Bullets. Stock does make them considerably easier to keep alive. They are pretty expensive, but magic attacks also means they chew through Fizz Resist, so they can tear apart any, like, big demons or any of the big characters that have Fizz Resist, they do quite well against. Again, this unit's a pretty high-risk, high-reward, because they are pretty expensive. They hit really, really hard, but they're also very fragile, so... I risk a reward, but they can re uh, White Wolves, literally never use these guys. I, I have, I can't even tell the top of my head what they do, because I don't use them. They have, what, ITP and Encourage, which on a backline unit isn't that helpful. 
these are kind of stats you want on the front line. You want these these stats make them fight in melee longer, and we don't want them fighting in melee at all. We want them running away from melee, so those don't help. Yeah. Basically the summary of missile units is use huntsmen. <laughs> these guys are crazy good. On to cavalry, Empire Knight. Your cheapest knight, your basic blocker. They get in the way. They aren't doing a whole lot of damage, they aren't winning a whole lot of fights. They get in the way of your enemy and let your missile units retreat safely and turn around and shoot. They're really just there to get in the way and allow your missile units to shoot wherever they're holding down. They can hold down big single entities, they can fight cav long enough. They actually beat a lot of light cav. Um, anything that's not armor piercing, they'll uh, will have a hard time killing them because they do have 110 armor. They're very, very tanky. Um, yeah. Reichsguard. Reichsguard, you don't see a whole lot because they're overshadowed by Knights of the Blazing Sun for only 50 more. Um, the only time you really see Reichsguard is if you're against probably either Chaos Dwarves or um, High Elves, where their cavalry units have good fire resist and you don't want Knights of the Blazing Sun. Um, other than that, you don't want to see Reichsguard. Knights of the Blazing Sun are a very solid mid to high tier cavalry unit. They have exceptional charge bonus, again, exceptional armor, shields, spell resist. They're very, very strong. They are kind of your base, your principal cav unit. That's the one I use the most often. Um, the only time I go more expensive than these is if I need armor piercing. If I don't need a lot of armor piercing on my cav, then these guys do very, very well charging infantry, fighting other cav. They do well against a cav regenerating unit like skin wolves because they have fire damage. They do exceptionally well. Knights of the Blazing Sun is a really well, really, really well rounded cavalry unit. Uh, so it looks like guard kind of in the same boat as the basic ones. They have Vanguard Deploy and ITP. Vanguard Deploy on a Cav unit is okay, but you usually don't need it because your Cav are fast enough. They have the extra speed, which is pretty neat, but... Eh, it's kind of a pretty hefty price to pay. Their stats are okay, but again, why not just go for a Demi at this point? Speaking of Demis, Demis. Demi Flances, I don't find myself using a whole lot. Um, they're better against infantry. They do pretty well in the charge. But I never find myself struggling to kill infantry when I have this this unit right here. For, like Empire, so many other ways to kill infantry. I don't find myself needing these guys that often. Um, but they do all right. Like they're pretty solid at charge cycle charging. They do okay into other cav. But if you're fighting cav, you kind of want halberds. Halberds are of course you know your principal anti cav option. They do well into large single entities. As I was saying in the replays, they're very nice sweeper units to come and clear your backline from any enemy cav or monsters that get in back in there and just to clear them out really quick. They're a very good target for healing. Demi Halberds are a very, very solid anti-large unit. They're your really best choice against an armored enemy cav, aside from shooting them. So uh, yeah, I could take Halberds pretty often. Demi Knights, I don't find much use for. Griffites, better stats, terror, can be useful. Um, they kind of do a lot of the same job. Granted, they do it a little bit better for 350 extra. Um, I'll be honest, I don't bring them that often, but I probably would explore that more. I haven't tried them. I probably should. So maybe try that one out and tell me what you guys think. Missile Cav and Chariots. Pistoliers. Um, Pistoliers are alright. They're really safe. They do okay damage, um, but they're kind of overshadowed. They're definitely overshadowed, so I don't use them a whole lot, but they're, they're solid. Outriders. Again, solid. They have really good damage output. 30 missile strength on an AP cav missile unit is really, really good. Um, but again, we have grenade launchers, so we don't use them very often. <laughs> um, if you need to kill a single entity, they're actually, again, not bad. I don't use them that often because I don't, again, I don't feel like I need single entity killing. And against infantry, we have these guys. And against cav. These guys do very well into both infantry and cav. They're not armor piercing, but they hit so hard that they'll do very, very well into armored infantry and cavalry just fine. Uh, they rely on explosive damage, so they really only shoot multi entities. Against single entities, they're pretty useless. But this is your principal anti anti infantry unit. Even if you're going for that more static infantry line, I was still summoning grenade launchers just positioning behind my line to shoot into the front line. They clear infantry so so fast. This unit is incredibly strong. Yeah, I bring one or two of these in almost all of my builds at least. Um, I never really go for four. I usually go like two or three at most. Even if I'm going full kite, I'll bring like maybe two in the starter and one in the reserve. Um, if I'm going for more infantry heavy build, I'll just bring two in the reserve and bring them out after the enemy shooting or whatever counter they have to these is gone. Just clean up infantry. Uh, yeah. Fun little fact, these guys are not flagged as doing uh, fire damage, but they do deal fire damage. So they do extra damage to anything that regenerates, and they stop healing a little bit. War Wagons. This unit probably needs no introduction. They are Missile Chariot. Very, very hard to shut down. Solid long-range armor-piercing DPS. 
good at shooting big singletes, cavalry, specifically armored cav, and they're very good to cover your other mobility tools, your grenade launcher and your cav, to support them by shooting their counters. They shoot the enemy mobility tools and kind of help you assert that dominance in the mobility game. That's what they're very, very good at. Like I said, they're very hard to shut down. They're a decent chariot in melee. Uh, like you saw in the replays, I was charging them in a little bit to try and break off low leadership ones. That's not their primary use, but they can do that. What they really want to be doing is just shooting enemy mobility and really giving you that mobility dominance. Mortar wagons. Um, mortars in general have pretty underwhelming damage output and accuracy. So I don't find myself using these guys a whole lot, and they cut into my uh, caps, my missile cav caps, so I don't use these guys a whole lot. The Black Lions I use quite a bit. Um, this is just a Hell Blaster and a War Wagon. So basically it's a Hell Blaster with mobility. It hits very, very hard. It has a very good range. It can kill single entities, it can kill cavalry, it can kill monster infantry, it can kill infantry. Like this thing is just incredible if you can keep it safe. As long if you're not against a heavy shooting faction that can actually outshoot this thing, it's very, very hard to shut down, and it can just be an absolute terror. I've seen this thing easily get 3k value, just shooting into into the like single entities, infantry. It's a very, very strong unit. It's a little micro-intensive. Against infantry, you're only getting shots down the side, but it can really, really pay for itself if you give it the time. All right, artillery. So artillery, as a general rule, I don't bring a whole lot of for two reasons. One is that my front line like, is pretty flimsy, so it's hard to protect. And the second is that I have to protect it. <laughs> Once I summon an artillery piece, it ties me down. As you saw in the kite, uh, replay. I really value the ability to just, on a dime, move from one side of the map to the other if I'm losing a fight or if I've already won the fight and need to move somewhere else. That is very, very valuable to me, the ability to just transition that quickly. And artillery, if artillery is on the field, that means I cannot do that. So I'm very um, hesitant to bring artillery a lot of the time. It can be very strong, but I need a compelling reason to do it. I don't just spam artillery. Um, mortars. As I was saying, Poor accuracy, middling damage output. They're okay for shooting like high elf archers. They do very well in those tightly packed elven formations. Um, but I find it hard to justify these guys. Cannons, cannons are solid. Um, they do well into low model count units. Cavalry, single entities, monster infantry. They're pretty solid, pretty reliable. Good long range. Uh, if you need to artillery duel, they're your go-to. Um, oftentimes you take the ROR as it just has a pretty hefty damage increase. Magic attacks are nice, the Fizzers is nice, but really just does almost 50% more damage for only 300 more gold. So the ROR is like your go-to anti-enemy artillery, anti-big you know, dino, that kind of thing. Hellblasters. Hellblasters suffer from a range problem. They hit very, very hard because the range is so short and so they're such a fragile artillery piece. It's hard to get value out of them unless you mount them on a war wagon. So you don't see these guys a whole lot. Hellstorms. The basic Hellstorms don't do a whole lot, um, they're not very accurate, they don't fire that many rockets per volley, the only time I really see these guys is when you're really trying to win a shootout against Thay or Dwarves, the kind that you know, really outbox you and can't and can deal with your kite effectively, so this is kind of a desperation pick I find most of the time. Um, so the basic one I don't love. The ROR Sunmaker is exceptional, if you need to delete a lot of infantry from downrange, this is your go-to. <laughs> Um, it fires like twice as many rockets per volley. It has much less ammo, but it fires... I think I think the math works out. They fire the same number of rockets, they fire all their ammo, but the Sunmaker does a lot faster, which is very, very good, because it means you can summon it, dump its ammo downrange in about two minutes, and then desummon it for a full refund, which you can, if you can do that, it's a very, very powerful play. Um, the problems with it are that, A, it's so expensive, uh, and B, everybody and their mother has seen this thing in Domination and is scared of it, so they're gonna have countermeasures. Like, almost everybody has knows what's, is concerned about it showing up, so they'll have some kind of means of sniping it, or avoiding it, or shutting it down. So you need to be kind of careful with it. I find it's very valuable, actually, as a summon. If you start on the battlefield and they don't see it, they'll push, your opponent may push up into a position where then they become very vulnerable to it, and you can surprise them with a summon, and then start raining down death on them. And then they're kind of scrambling to answer it. It can be very, very devastating. Um, it's also, because it's so expensive and is just raw damage and isn't able to contest points or control mobility fights, um, you really, really need to actually wipe your opponent off the table if you're taking this because you're giving so many funds to not controlling space. 
Uh, the Luminarch. So the Luminarch was buffed. What was it, 3.0 that it got buffed? Um, they actually doubled its fire rate. So it actually hits really, really hard against single entities. It does do so well in the infantry. It does okay in the cavalry. What it really wants to be shooting is, is single entities. Um, the problem is... There's a couple of problems with it. First of all, is that the Black Lions do its job better. A little more expensive, but they do its job much better. Second is that it misses quite a bit. Um, its accuracy is so-so. Its speed is so-so, and it's not that durable. So it's pretty easy to shut down and avoid. So I don't really like this thing. If I really need to be shooting a single entity, I'll bring cannons or the Black Lions, and they do the job a lot better. Even Huntsmen do the job better, so... Like, it's kind of a neat pick, but it's really just not that relevant when you have so many things to do its job better. Let me talk about the Arwar Luminarch. Uh, what is that? The net is kind of neat. The net's only 100 meter range, and it's only 50 speed, so it kind of has a hard time getting where it needs to be. Like, if something's that close to net, I mean, you are very much within your effective range and are going to hit it pretty reliably. Um, but the thing is, you net it, you shoot it once, and then you got to run, because it's going to get out of that net, and it's going to come after that Luminarch unless you have something to protect it. And it's just a more expensive thing that has the same problems as all of the other ones. Uh, the meme tank. It's kind of a single entity cannon. It's very durable. Melee is, I mean, it's 10 melee defense, so it takes a lot of damage, but it is fairly tanky at 160 armor, 9k HP, but... I don't know, I've tried to use this thing for artillery dueling. And it's okay for that, just because it's so durable, but most artillery is armor piercing anyway. So I don't really love this thing. It's a bit of a meme. It's extremely expensive, and again, the job is much more easily done by it. Like, if you need to kill an artillery piece, just take three cannons for only slightly more. So, this thing's a bit of a meme. And that is the full roster. So, on to builds. Talking builds, if we're going for that full kite style I, I showed initially, a really strong core that I like is what I showed, the Triple Blazing Sun Knight, Three grenade launchers, three war wagons. This is a very, very strong skirmishing core and very hard for a lot of people to shut down. You can toy with this a little bit, maybe take a little less war wagons, bring some more cav, or bring some flagellants. Having the flagellants in your starter is quite nice. As I said, they are a nice anti-infantry option, as well as being fast enough to deny engagements. If you're facing things like vampire counts, there's a lot of zombies you need to chew through that maybe aren't worth your grenades firing into. Having the flagellants just go and tear apart zombies for two minutes is very, very effective. Um, Lord for this, I usually just take Gelt and desummon him. Gelt is your cheapest desummon option, so I really don't have a Lord that's terribly appealing for this, especially when I want to spend so much money in my starter. But I just take Gelt and I desummon him, and maybe I'll chevron some of my knights, or maybe I'll upgrade this to a demi. And probably not a demi lance, but yeah. This kind of skirmishing core, the three blazing sun knights, the three grenade launchers is extremely strong. And you can throw in the flashes of the war wagons to back it up if you want, or if you really want to, you can go for Boris or Volkmar or something like that. That's a very, very strong starting core, and then I would usually back it up with lots of infantry, a couple of greatswords to clean up, just some swordsmen, some spears, that kind of thing. Maybe a couple of free company, maybe a couple of huntsmen. I kind of like huntsmen as another late game summon, even in kite builds, because they can tear apart cav, and enemy cav aren't going to be going for them, because they're going to be focused on my grenade launchers and my war wagons. So actually bring them in vanguard summon in the mid game. It'd be pretty effective, because you can just come in and shoot off whatever's threatening your skirmish elements. Um, if I really need to, if I'm against a faction with good cavalry of their own, you know, vampire counts, uh, dark elves, high elves, that kind of thing, I can bring in some demigriffs, help clear off that elite calf, maybe even ogres, that kind of thing. So something like this is a pretty solid kite build, maybe not the Volkmar. Yeah, go back to the Gelt. Just desummon Gelt. Grab those other war wagons in the starter. Then I starter, and then, you know, we have to slot in a wizard somewhere. So we just reinforce him, bring him nice and cheap with just earth blood, light bloom on foot. And this is a pretty solid generalist kite build, this kind of thing. Yeah, you can, if you don't need the demis, you can drop the demis, bring a little bit more infantry, bring a little bit more mid tier cav, whatever you like. Or for that more static position, I've quite liked Volkmar to buff up my front line. Doing something like this. In addiction, I could take or leave. I haven't really made a decision on that. So again, try that out. Let me know what you think. Then we just bring, you know, a core of like four or five of each of these guys. The uh, Hammer of the Witch is a, as our centerpiece. A couple of Huntsmen. Huntsmen, like I said, are really good at shooting out any other uh, an infantry missile unit, as long as it's not armored or shielded. 
the stealth means they're pretty safe in the approach against artillery. I could even throw some flash ones to give me some nice uh, infantry clear. Then, you know, summon in some Empire Knights. Make sure we have that peel, backline peel tool. Some grenade launchers really help us clear out the infantry. And then even maybe some more great swords or some more speeders to help even this out. And this is the kind of thing I would go for for that more static style, although I need a caster. Probably drop a couple of these spears and bring a wizard. Wizards are generally considered good. So yeah, again, life caster does really well. So we have a lot more infantry, just the earth blood. And maybe the flesh stone for our demis is solid. And then we can give this guy a shield and call it a day. So something like this can be also pretty good as that static style. Even summon some more huntsmen if you want some more foot shooting. Maybe bring out a little bit less cav if you don't have as many backline threats coming at you. Or drop the great swords if you know, there's not a lot of armor and infantry you need to worry about. So yeah, that's generally kind of where I start out for my builds for different styles. You could go all in on an infantry style, which I don't really favor, but it's an option. It's more of like a you know, full dwarven style where you just bring lots and lots of halberds and guns. Which is an option. I'd, again, I don't favor it, but it's something you go for, something like this. And just bring a ton of more infantry. Lots of options. Play around with it. Figure out, figure out what kind of style you like for yourself. And, you know, let me know what you guys think. That's all I got for this video, though. Thank you guys so much for watching. Hope you found this helpful. Hope this helped you figure out, you know, a little bit of the nuances of how Empire plays in Domination. If you enjoyed it, found it helpful, like, comment, subscribe, all that jazz. Thanks so much. I will see you next time.